the movie capital of the world. They say it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Well, it's also a dog-eat-man world, apparently, because it's the scene of an ongoing scandal over canine cops. Charges that the police dogs are mauling hundreds of innocent, or at the very least, non-threatening suspects. I sent our Gail Anderson out here to learn if the problem is the dog or the master. I'm on patrol with the West Covina Police Department, about 20 miles outside of the Los Angeles, California area. The police dog handlers in this community of 97,000 people encounter all kinds of situations, gang violence, murder, narcotics. And when their work takes them face to face with a suspect, their dogs know to bark and guard. But if that suspect runs away or acts in a threatening manner, their police dogs know to bite and hold. You see a police canine attacking a suspect in this graphic videotape shot by the Los Angeles Police Department and obtained exclusively by Now It Can Be Told. LAPD suspect was Vandal who fled. In the last three years, he's one of more than a thousand suspects bitten by police dogs in Los Angeles. Next time, don't run from the police and hide. You'll get this problem. You know what I mean? Critics charge the problem is not just in Los Angeles. They claim the use of police dogs across the country appears to be out of control. It's like a live chainsaw. It is literally unleashing vicious animals who are trained to be vicious um, with no justification whatsoever. Item, West Palm Beach, Florida. A sleeping homeless woman is mauled to death by a local police dog. Item, Nashville, Tennessee. A robbery suspect is bitten and killed, his throat severed by a police dog. By comparison, dog bite victim Curtis King was lucky. They told me to put my hands behind my back and lay on the ground. And when I did, they just told the dog to chew, and the dog just started chewing on my leg. And I just started screaming. American Civil Liberties attorney Don Cook represents victims of dog attacks. Dogs are one of the greatest law enforcement uh, uh, weapons for abuse. When a person is found by a police dog, he's surrounded only by officers. That person is usually a suspect. Unlike a baton, a handler who has a dog, all he has to do is stand still and not do a thing and let the dog do his thing. And then you write up a report that says the man fought with the dog. The man kicked at the dog and he got bit. Well, that's too bad. Welcome, everybody. I'm Geraldo Rivera. We'll look at the bungled biosphere and at what Jack Ruby left behind later in the program. Up front today, a chilling throwback to the Middle Ages. Our Richard Weiss tracks the course of a wretched illness, one that centuries ago killed millions. Well, it's back, and it threatens us once again. Geraldo, it's called the Black Death or Bubonic Plague. It's the most devastating disease ever to hit mankind. Most people think this disease came and went with the rat-infested slums of the Middle Ages. Well, now it can be told this deadly disease is alive today, right here in the U.S. Believe it or not, this innocent-sounding nursery rhyme is actually about the bubonic plague. It was written centuries ago when, due to this disease, both children and adults were literally falling down in the streets. The deadly disease is now in America, and it's still taking people's lives. I don't think I got worried until all the doctors and everybody started making so much fuss over me, and then I think maybe that worried me. And also knowing that my neighbor down the road had died a couple of weeks before with the plague. Bubonic plague dates back to the time of the pharaohs of Egypt. It was medically described back in the 12th and 14th centuries, hitting widespread populations and killing over 25 million people in Europe alone. The disease got its name from the large buboes or lumps formed in the victim's lymph node systems. Once an individual is afflicted with the disease, his groin and armpit areas enlarge, causing extreme pain. I began to feel worse and worse, and uh, the second day I developed swellings under the arms, and uh, no inclination whatsoever to do any work. Spent uh, most of the day reading, sleeping, dozing. 
a lot of people do think bubonic plague was just a disease of the Middle Ages. They read about the Black Death, and that's all the information they have on the plague. Well, since about uh, 100 years ago in southwestern China, we started seeing uh, the latest plague pandemic, worldwide epidemic of plague, and from Southeast Asia to Hawaii to the United States. It got onto ships and came into uh, San Francisco. It uh, went into the uh, uh, domestic rat population in San Francisco, uh, causing uh, human cases of plague. And I think it persisted up until about 1906 or 1907. Dr. David Dennis of the Center for Disease Control in Fort Collins, Colorado, says the San Francisco epidemic may have ended, but the plague is very much alive. What temporarily halted the disease in San Francisco at that point? Um, I don't think it's really known, but it was most likely the fact that there was a combination of things, that there was better sanitation and hygiene, uh, that the germ itself may have become uh, less virulent, uh, that the rat population may have developed uh, some resistance uh, to, the, uh, to the germ. Today, bubonic plague has been detected in 13 states. Item. In 1981, President Reagan's ranch was evacuated because of indications that prairie dogs were carrying plague-infected fleas. Item. During the 1984 Olympics, Los Angeles' Griffiths Park was quietly evacuated due to plague-infected rats. Plague is maybe out there in nature, and then it has an interface with people's homes by particularly cats uh, going out and uh, catching uh, rodents that may be infected. Uh, developing plague themselves, they actually can develop a pneumonic plague or plague in their lungs. They can come into the home and the person caring for that cat can be exposed. Item. Since 1970, over 290 Americans have contracted bubonic plague. 15% of those have died. Person is, is very tired looking, very sick looking, and would come to the, to the poisoning, uh, poison actually produced by the bacteria. All I wanted to do was sleep. I was just, I was just uh, very, very tired. Tom Smith still lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he contracted plague from an infected flea. It bit him while he was getting logs from a wood pile. If the plague had advanced, uh, say, had invaded my lungs, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. For more than 100 years, the Statue of Liberty has lifted its torch of hope, welcoming millions of immigrants to their new home, the United States of America. But for those who actually want to visit the great American landmark, it's as if Liberty's promise has been rewritten to answer the question, what price freedom? Give me your tired, your poor, your six bucks ahead. I don't think it's fair. I think we should be able to come here free of charge. There should be no charge. Uh, this is just unbelievable. Hmm. It's our heritage. Why should we have to pay to look at something that is a gift to us? These visitors are upset with the fare they must pay Circle Line Statue of Liberty Incorporated, the ferry service which transports visitors to the Statue of Liberty. Only 14 months ago, a ticket for adults was $3.25. Today, it is $6. And by this December, it is expected to rise to $8. Now, a lot of people have the impression that the money they pay for the tickets on the Circle Line actually ends up going toward the upkeep of Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. Is that impression correct? No. Uh, we, many of us in the Park Service would like it to, but the, all the concessions, contracts, uh, the revenue derived from concessions goes back to the general fund. It goes back to the Treasury. But the U.S. Treasury only receives 10% of the gross receipts. The rest of the money is kept by Circle Line. In 1990, it is estimated that that amounted to a whopping $9 million. To give one uh, uh, boating operation, the exclusive rights uh, to go to uh, the Statue of Liberty and to Ellis Island, and where people want to go and visit their roots, I think is very unholy, and I think it's wrong. New Jersey Congressman Frank Guarini is outraged that the National Park Service granted Circle Line the concession, and in doing so, handed it a virtual monopoly. How could the government allow this to happen? Well, I think it happened because of the sweetheart deal was made with Circle Line because what they basically did was negotiate a contract where these three million plus people would have to rely only on that one company to bring them here and I think that's on American and it's on business like there were other companies that would have liked to have bid even one that wanted to run a, a non-profit business here and they were excluded uh, a Mr. Sloan uh, wanted to sit down with the National Park people he wasn't even given a meeting 